This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, everyone. A warm, yes, warm, blessed welcome to you. It's gotten a little warm in Fountain Hills, hasn't it here? You know, in the Midwest, like 20 below hurts your skin. The heat hurts your skin too, doesn't it? All right, so we're going to live stream from Sholo, from Flagstaff, from, no, don't you think? Satellite campuses? Good morning to those who are in cooler climes as well. Blessings to you. We have a couple of announcements before we begin. We have our, hey, pastor, I have a question. That is a, our summer Bible study. And uh, we actually started with the Nicene Creed last week. We're going to do it again this week and probably the following week. It'll take three weeks to get through. Uh, but it is online. And if you've ever been curious about the Nicene Creed, why we have it, why we say what we say, I would encourage you to go online and listen to it. It's on our YouTube channel. Uh, we also have game night coming up. So this Friday, this June 17th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Barb Gibson, are there any comments or anything about it? So Barb will have, uh, for those who are online too, Barb will have an instructional time right beforehand about the various uh, games and so forth that will be played. Okay, that's 6.30, come 6.30 to 8.30, in, come and enjoy yourself. We also then have movie night coming up, that's Saturday, June 25th, 7 p.m. That is The Case for Christ. It is based on Lee Strobel's best-selling book, The Case for Christ, which we have copies on the back table if you're interested. So uh, come in and uh, invite friends to that. We also, you've noticed it's been cr pretty crazy and violent in the news lately, right? So uh, we are going to put on the front doors new locking mechanisms that can be locked if necessary during worship time. So we would have somebody back there, but I think it's, you know, the board talked about this. It's wise to at least do something like that. So that'll be, what? Uh, that door, you can't get in unless you have the breaker bar. Uh, so, you, so it's only the breaker bar right there. It's always locked from the outside. Uh, so that's going to be put in in the next week or two or whenever we can get the guy to come. As you know, it's been very hard to get people to come and actually do the work lately. Um, uh, so we are going to have a financial update next week. Talked about, you know, having a financial update throughout the year, not just at the end of the year. So next week we'll have a financial update. And um, I also want to let you know that although I don't have a slide in here, we did the baby bottles, right? The baby bottle drive. Our church contributed 14000 uh, not, I think it's, it's, it was over, no, sorry. Now it's going to sound really bad. $1,491. Yeah, I was like, 14000 wow. We would have been the premier church everywhere. But uh, I'll have to, yeah. I don't know if I should do any financial update next week. Um, anyway, so, but I will uh, let you know how that compares, but we did really well with that amount, okay? So that's actually really good for ch any church of any size in the valley, certainly in Fountain Hills. All right, yeah, 14,000. How old am I? 60, 61, 62. <laughs> for those who are here, you'll get that, you got that joke. All right. We do everything because God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Amen. Will you please stand as you are able? We begin our time of worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our call to worship is from Psalm 99. Together, please. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. 
The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Indeed, he is holy. And this day, let us sing together, holy, holy, holy. Indeed, God is holy, holy, holy. He is transcendent above all, and yet he is with us. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's come before our holy God, confess our sins, and receive his wonderful forgiveness. Merciful God and Heavenly Father, whose grace endures to all generations. You are patient and long-suffering and will forgive the sins and transgressions of those who truly repent. Look with compassion upon your people and hear their supplications. We have sinned against you and are unworthy of your goodness and love. Remember not our transgressions. Have mercy on us and help us, O God. Grant us remission of all our sins and give us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may amend our ways and with you obtain everlasting life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If that indeed is your confession with a repentant heart, I declare to you what Christ declares. Your sins, all of them, are forgiven. Amen. You may be seated. We have a time of prayer. Uh, I'm going to add Judy K., who I have to use all the last initials with the Judys and Lindas and so forth. But Judy K. had knee surgery, knee, knee replacement surgery uh, this week, so we're adding her to the list. Let's come first before the Lord in thanksgiving. 
Holy God, merciful God, mighty God, we give you thanks and praise. We praise you for your creation, for the glory, your glory, that is seen throughout all of creation. We thank you for your power and your might. We thank you for your steadfast love throughout the generations. And we thank you for the redemption that we have through Christ Jesus. And we give you praise and glory for the Holy Spirit who has come to guide us, convict us, lead us ever closer into relationship with you through Jesus. So we praise you, Holy God, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. We come before you, caring Father, because of the love that you have for each of us, we ask that you would heal our loved ones. And so we lift them up this morning, and we lift up the family of joy. And we pray for Wayne, for Rick, for Lisa, for Judy T., Heidi, for Joyce, Diane, Judy K. We pray for the friends of Joy Church. And so we lift up Jen, Bill, and Roger. We pray for Linda Shaw, for William and Rita. We lift up Marlene, Beth, Lene, Jason, George, Brian B., Eleanor, Janice, and Denny. And, and I don't remember if I also prayed for Joyce and Diane, family of, of Joy Church. Lord, we ask that you would heal them. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for encouragement. We pray for strength. We pray for faith. And the work of the Holy Spirit in Gabe, and Joe, Jack, and Steve. We lift up those who are dealing with substance abuse, emotional relationship difficulties. We pray for all marriages, families, and we pray for those who have lost a spouse or a child. Lord, in your mercy, we lift up those who are in depression right now, who are in despair and darkness and thinking of taking their own life. Holy Spirit, shine the light of Christ Jesus in their hearts right now. Let them know how much they are loved by you. And we continue to pray for the protection of the unborn, that men and women throughout the world realize that life is precious from the very beginning the very end, because you, gracious God, are the author of all life. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are being martyred for the sake of faith in Christ Jesus. We pray for their strength. We pray for fortitude. We pray for their physical well-being. And we also pray for the enemies, the dictators, leaders, and anyone who is oppressing people throughout the world who are killing them, maiming them, sending them to jail. So we ask that you strike repentance in their hearts and they stop their evil and wicked ways. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for all of the missionaries throughout the world who are sharing your word, Heavenly Father. We pray for their strength, for their wisdom, and we pray for their safety as well. We pray that if the spiritual ground is hard, that you break that ground, that you open the hearts so when the gospel is preached, souls are saved. And so we lift up all of the missionaries 
in the AFLC. We also pray for the pastors and that there would be more pastors in the AFLC. Men of God who will stand firm in your word to shepherd the flocks. We lift up St. Peter's in Illinois that they may find a shepherd soon and also Redeemer Free Lutheran in Michigan. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We really thank you for the work that you're doing here in this church. And we pray for the leading of the Holy Spirit to continue to guide us, to grow us, to shape us, all to your glory. Lord, in your mercy, we lift up our nation to you. There's so much hatred and division abounding in our nation right now. We pray for repentance. We pray for peace that can only come from knowing Christ Jesus and his gospel. And we pray for all of our leaders that they may know Jesus and are guided by his truth and his righteousness. Lord, in your mercy, and now we lift up our own prayers unto you. Lift this all up in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. Now we'll have a sharing of God's Word as a reminder. On your sermon notes, you have all of the Bible passages and page numbers for your pew in the Pew Bible. Good morning. I'm filling in for my husband today, who's not here. <laughs> anyway, we're, our first reading is from Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, and it can be uh, found on your pew Bible on page 178. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign as a, as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the door steps of your house and on your gates. Our second reading is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19, and it can be found on your pew Bible on page 1168. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Will you please stand as you are able for reading of the gospel? The gospel is found in John chapter 16, start, starting with verse 4. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may, be, may remember what I told them to you, that I told them to you. 
I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, this Sunday is Trinity Sunday. Once a year, we do the Athanasian Creed. It is one of the three creeds that we hold to as a profession of faith. It's longer, and we're going to do it as a response sorrel because it is long. It also says the Catholic faith in here. Now, Catholic is small letter C. Catholic means universal. As a matter of fact, we are all part of the Catholic or universal faith. Okay? You ready? We do this once a year, whether it's good for us or not. Okay, here we go. Whoever wants to be saved must, above all, Hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and inviolate will doubtless perish eternally. This, however, is the Catholic faith, that we worship one God in Trinity and the tr Trinity in unity, neither confusing the person nor dividing the substance. For the person of the Father is one, that of the Son another, and that of the Holy Spirit still another. But the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. What the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated, the Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is unlimited, the Son is unlimited, the Holy Spirit is unlimited. The Father is eternal. The Son is eternal. The Holy Spirit is eternal. And yet there are not three eternal beings, but one who is eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated or unlimited beings, but one who is uncreated and unlimited. In the same way, the Father is almighty. The Son is almighty. The Holy Spirit is almighty. And yet there are not three almighty beings, but one who is almighty. Thus the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. Thus the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord, and yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. For just as we are compelled by the Christian truth, to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord. So we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to say there are three gods or three lords. The Father was neither made nor created nor begotten by anyone. The Son is from the Father alone, not made or created, but begotten. The Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son, not made or created or begotten, but proceeding. Therefore, there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, none is before or after, greater or less than another. 
but all three persons are in themselves co-eternal and co-equal, so that, as has been stated above, in all things the Trinity in unity and the unity in Trinity must be worshipped. Therefore, who wants to be saved should think thus about the Trinity. But it is necessary for eternal salvation that one also faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the true faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at once God and a human being. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and a human being born from the substance of his mother in this age. He is perfect God and a perfect human being. Composed of a rational soul and human flesh, he is equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and a human being, nevertheless, he is not two, but one Christ. However, he is not one by the changing of his divinity in the flesh, but by the taking up of the humanity in God. Indeed, he is, not, he is one not by a confusion of substance, but by a unity of person. For as the rational soul and the flesh are one human being, so God and the human being are one in Christ. He suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose from the dead, ascended into the heavens, is seated at the right hand of the Father, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all human beings will rise with their bodies and will give an account of their own deeds. Those who have done good things will enter into the eternal life, and those who have done evil things into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. A person cannot be saved without believing this faith faithful. Amen. It's long, right? But this is worth doing once a year. And if you've ever wondered about that word begotten, come either online Wednesday or in person, and we're going to discuss what that word begotten means. You may be seated. And now we are going to sing, We Believe. In this time of desperation, when all we know We believe, we believe. 
Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and he's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and he's coming back again. Let the lost be found and the dead be raised in the here and now. Let love invade. Let the church live loud. Our God will say, we believe, we believe. And the gates of hell will not prevail. For the power of God has torn the veil. Now we know your love will never fail. We believe, we believe. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And he's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. We believe. We believe. Let's pray. Holy God and merciful God, thank you for your word. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Open our hearts, open our minds, open our soul, so that you and you alone are our sole focus, our priority in life, that we come ever closer to you, knowing your love for us, and let your love for us fill us so that we love you ever more. In Jesus' name, amen. When you love someone, when you are in a relationship and maybe decide to get married, there seems to be certain stages of love in that relationship, right? In the beginning, they call it the newlywed phase, where everything is fine and whatever that other person does is perfect, right? You've been around newlyweds before and after all, it's like, okay, calm down. But you know... There's that new love. And then you're together for a while. And you start to get used to each other. And everything is still fine, but you start to settle in, don't you? And then after a while, you start to notice that maybe they weren't exactly who you thought they were. And you start to become a little dissatisfied. And sometimes people become disillusioned, right? And at that time, then you might decide to end that relationship. But, and I can tell you this for a fact, for the people who stick with it, who work at it, and it's work. Everybody who's been married a while know it's work. And it takes commitment. On the other side of that is greater love. It is a, a love that might not have the fiery flames of that new love, but it's a burning ember that is an ever greater comfort and love than you could have imagined. You see, I think our relationship with God kind of goes in stages like that too. Our love for God. When we first know God and know that He loves us, there is a zeal, right? Right? You've been around new Christians, and they're like, well, calm down a little bit, a little too much. But they want to talk about God and love all the time. And so what do they do? They join a church, and they start to settle in, and they get involved in things. And then they notice that not everybody in church is perfect. They're not quite living up to all those particular standards, right? And then they start to study the Bible, and you kind of go, well, that's a hard saying. And that's not exactly what I grew up with, and that's, and they become disillusioned, right? And there are times when people become disillusioned at that point, 
that they leave the faith. They say, I no longer believe. But, and can all, I can also attest this as a fact, for those who stick with it and work at their faith. And it is work, by the way, isn't it? For those who know, it's work and a commitment. On the other side, is an ever greater knowing God, knowing His love for each one of you, and your heart is filled with a greater love for Him. That you start to understand there, there's an intimacy, right? An intimacy of knowing God, knowing the height, the depth, the breadth, the width of His love for you. And then your love for Him. So today's Trinity Sunday. And it's really easy just to make Trinity Sunday an academic exercise. Let's define God. But that's not it at all. Not at all. You see, Trinity, Trinity Sunday is not just a study about God. It is about knowing God ever more and knowing the love that He has for you. Ultimately, this message is one of love, the height, the depth, the breadth of God and His love for you. What is that song, the old song? To know Him is to love Him, and to love Him is to know Him. So that's what Trinity Sunday is really about. So let's begin loving, knowing and loving God. First of all, we say we believe in one God, right? We believe in one God. God, not many gods. This fact is attested to in Scripture throughout. And in fact, there's an important part, one of the readings today from Deuteronomy is very important to our faith and to understanding God. One God. It's called the Shema, and it's Shema means here. And it begins this way in Deuteronomy. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. By the way, Jesus reiterated this in the Gospel of Mark. It says this, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he, Jesus, answered them well, he asked, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. See, why is this important that we confess one God? Because against every other religion and other philosophies and so forth, there are many gods. There are many gods, lowercase g throughout the world. That was the case in the Old Testament. That was the case in the New Testament too. So in the Old Testament, there was Baal, there was Asherah and others. The Greeks, they had Zeus, Apollo, Dionysus, Ares, and so forth. The Romans had many other gods as well. But God said, there is one God, and you shall worship him and him alone. There is even one faith that masquerades today as a Christian faith that has more gods than the Romans had gods. Do you know what that faith is? It's Mormon or Mormonism. Mormons say this, and by the way, on the back table, there is a guide to what Mormons believe, if you're interested, and take as many as you want. We print more here. Mormons say that God was once a man and became exalted to godhood. And you, if you follow the Mormon faith well, perfectly, I guess, you work really hard at it because you're saved by works in the Mormon faith, and you're married, you too can be exalted to godhood and reign over your own planet. Now, I have trouble with my own life. Reigning over another planet does not seem like a good idea. They'd be like, oh yeah, that's the planet Clayton got. You know? 
So this is, so there, <laughs> there was a little more laughter than I thought on that one. <laughs> so you have thousands upon thousands, if not millions of gods in the Mormon faith. But against all of this, God says, no, there's only one God and God alone. What commandment do we find that in? It's the first commandment, right? First commandment. I'm going to read the whole thing. Verse 1 through 6. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The Lord's very clear. There is one God and one God alone, and you shall worship Him. You shall not dilute your love with worship or love for other things, idols, or other gods. Now, it also says in here that I, the Lord, uh, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Some people have got hung up on that and have left the faith because they don't understand what that means. Jealousy is not some petty little emotion that God has. To be jealous is to be protective of that relationship. And you know this. A wife is protective or jealous of the relationship with her husband. She does not want him to flirt, to fawn over, be devoted, or have an affair with another, right? And a husband is jealous of that relationship with his wife. He is protective. He does not want her to flirt, to be devoted, have an affair with another. You get jealous. There's nothing wrong with that word in this particular context. God says, I'm it. I want that relationship with you and you alone, and I want you to have that relationship with me and me alone, above all things. You know, as I I was sitting there before the message, and Regina was reading the word in this, to love the Lord your God with heart, soul, and mind. And I see how far I fall on that. And yet God loves me. He is steadfast in his loves and keeps drawing me closer to him. You see, apart from other religions who have gods that are are unknowable, our God is knowable, to a degree at least, because he is personable to us. And we would say one God in three persons. And this is critical. So now let's just go to Trinity for a moment. This word Trinity, in a literal sense, means tri-unity. And we talked about that actually within the confession. The unity of the persons, the three persons of God. So we say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, when you're baptized, you're baptized in the name of of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So we'd say three persons. Some people might say, oh, hold on, the Bible doesn't use the word Trinity. And I would say, well, yes, that's true. And that's fine. It is a word we use to describe what Scripture declares, what God has declared. So, when we say person, a person is someone who has a distinct or separate identity. And we did that a lot in the creed, didn't we? The Father is God, but the Father is not the Son. The Son is God, but the Son is not the Father. Right? We did the whole thing there. So there's a distinction between each 
of the persons of the Trinity. And the distinction helps us to identify who they are, the functions, you could say, that each person has. So the Father has planned salvation for us. And the Father loved the world so much, what did He do? He gave His only Son, right? He sent the Son. And Jesus, because of the love of the Father and the love for you, what did He do? He went to the cross for you to pay the price for your sins. That's the love of the Son. And then the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the function of the Holy Spirit is to, one, work in the lives of believers, but also to convict us of sin. You ever been going along and all of a sudden you're convicted of sin? That would be the power of the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit always points you back to the cross, to Jesus, and to what He has done. So we believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, but not three gods. One God in three persons because they all have the same essence. Each person of the Trinity has the same essence. What's essence? Well, I realize I used a little bit of a self-referential definition here. That was which is essential for its existence. Okay, that doesn't help a whole lot, right? There you go. Water, H2O. That's what water is. If you mess with that at all and just have HO or H2O2, you get something totally different, right? And it would be poisonous to us. So H2O, that is water. That's what's essential to it. If you take anything away or add something to it, you don't have water, right? You get that. So the question is, what's essential to God? What's essential to God? And there are some attributes, characteristics, that are the nature of God. So omnipotent. That means all-powerful. If God is not all-powerful, He's not God. Omniscient, all-knowing. If God is ever surprised by something, He's not God. Omnipresent, God is everywhere. If God is limited by time and space, He's not God. Eternal, immutable, which means unchangeable. There are some in the progressive Christianity that will say God evolves. Nonsense. There is no evolving with God. He is unchangeable. And by the way, if you're ever interested, there's lots of Scripture that would point to all of this. So these are some attributes or what is essential to God. But there are other aspects too. That He is the source. He is truth. He is the very source of truth. That he is holy, which is pure. That he is just and righteous. That he is loving and merciful. That he is gracious or grace-filled. All of these things come from God himself. That's who he is. That's who he is. And you can't say, Well, God is most of these things. No, God is either these things or He's not. Either God or not God. Jehovah's Witnesses one time, uh, one of the witnesses said, well, we believe that Jesus is close to, to what you think. I went, no, He's either God or not God. You can't have somebody be kind of God. Right? God or not God. The thing is, and this is critical, if you really want to know God who loves you, if you want to know who God is and how much He loves you, then you have to start to understand what is essential to Him. 
You have to really take some time to ponder and say, well, God doesn't change. Oh, what does that mean? And his promises then don't change. Oh, now you have assurance because his promises don't change. And God is holy. You know, I, I am convinced that most people in our culture today don't understand the holiness of God. And I've preached on this and taught on this before. But God is truly holy. He is pure. And there's an abhorrence to sin. Not just a little like, eh, I don't like. No, an abhor abhorrence to sin. And see, when you start to understand how holy God is, then you are also start to understand that song, Amazing Grace, and you really start to understand it's amazing grace that he would save a wretch like me. You know, there's a lot of um, uh, song contests going on. Uh, America's Got Talent. So I've watched little clips on that. And you see sometimes singers doing Amazing Grace. They had one just recently. I think it was an 11 or 12-year-old who was called up from the audience. This was like a one in a million chance. Called up from the audience to sing. And she sang Amazing Grace. And this little child girl had such a powerful voice. And she did all of these, what do you call them? They're flamboyant things about singing, you know, how somebody takes a song and they go, oh, you know, and all over the place. Not like that, like, <sighs> yeah, see, my planet would be a non-musical planet, apparently. <sighs> but she was doing all of this stuff, and I thought, wow, what a voice. I also thought, she has no idea what she's singing. She has no idea what she's singing. And so it pains me to hear some of these singers do all sorts of wonderful gymnastic leaps with their voice. But holy is God. And gracious is God. And that's why around the throne of heaven it says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. See, when you start to understand who God is and how holy he is, you start to understand the love that God has for you. You have to understand what is essential. So again, God the Father is pure holy. God the Son is pure holy. God the Holy Spirit is pure holy. They have the same essence. And yet, we say one in three persons. And so God the Father is God. And God the Father has the power of creation. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, who said? God said, let there be light. He has the power of creation. Also in Job chapter 38. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? God the Father has a power of creation and he is to be our object of worship. You see, Jesus told the woman at the well, he said this, Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. And yet, as transcendent as he is, as much as we worship him and should, he's also our Father. You see, when Jesus prayed, our Father who art in heaven, and we, we pray that every, every week, right? But Father means Abba. It's truly a term of endearment toward a child. The best we would say would be like daddy. So we have a father who loves us, who cares for us, who wants to see us come to good, not to evil. Our father who is in heaven, in this we pray. We also know that 
Jesus is God the Son. The beginning of the Gospel of John proclaims this so clearly. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There can be no mistake about this. And if you take a look from our reading in Colossians, it's wonderful what it says. For by Him, this is speaking of Jesus, for by Jesus all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers, authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And verse 19 says, For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, not just part, but the fullness of God. See, Jesus also claimed to be Yahweh. Remember, Yahweh means I am, and that's the name that God gave to Moses. Moses said, well, what name should I tell other people? What's your name? And God said, I am. Tell them that I am sent, sent, you, sent Moses to them. So you might say, but hold on. Where did Jesus actually claim that he was Yahweh? Well, in John chapter 8, verse 30, uh, 58, Jesus declares, before Abraham was, I am. He's saying that before Abraham existed, I existed before him. And he took on the same name that God gave to Moses. I am. This is why the Jews were going to stone him, because he was claiming equality with God. Jesus also accepted worship and glory, things that are prohibited. There's only one God, right? So how could Jesus, if he's not God, accept worship and glory? Jesus prayed this in John chapter 17, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And you also have to know, in the Old Testament, God said, I give my glory to no other. And yet Jesus said that he would have the glory before the world began. And yet God the Son loves you so much that he suffered and died on the cross. It has been said that the nails didn't hold him there on the cross. Love held him there on the cross. Love for the Father, love for you. God the Son is God. God the Holy Spirit is God. He possesses all the attributes of God. He is associated with God in creation. The Spirit was hovering over the waters. He works with the other persons of the Godhead in the work of redemption. And he's also associated, his name is associated even in baptism. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the person, but God. Paul even has this in his benediction in 2 Corinthians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And God, the Holy Spirit, loves the Father and the Son and you so much that He came and He'll convict you of sin. That's how much He loves you. Doesn't feel like love, though, does it? But he points you to the need of Jesus. And then once you are saved with faith in Christ Jesus, he continues to nudge you, to guide you, to sanctify you, which is about your holiness, which is who God is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. And while we can distinguish the persons of the Trinity, we can't divide them. We can't divide the essence. 
So you can't say that God the Father is up here, which is what most people say. God the Son is a little bit lower, and then we don't know where the Holy Spirit is, but somewhere in there. And that's what people say. And they are ranking God, but you can't because they have the exact same essence. It's mind-bending, isn't it? It's tough to take in. And yet, this is what Scripture attests. This is what God attests. So when you start to think about the Trinity and the triunity and the love of God, you have to understand this, that by His very nature, He is a God of relationship and love. The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father. The Father loves the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit loves the Father, and so on. Because to love in eternity, you need someone to love, don't you? And thus, there is love from the very, very beginning. You see, I said this really was a message of love. See, out of love, the Father had planned salvation. And out of love for us, He sent His only Son. And out of love for the Father and for you, for you, the Son went to the cross. And out of love for the Son and the Father, the Holy Spirit comes and guides you into all truth. Isn't that a perfect relationship of love? This is who God is. You see, to grow in the Christian faith is to grow in love. If you are in the Christian faith and you're not growing in love, you need to put some work in. You need to bring a greater commitment to this relationship you have. As you grow, you grow in love. Who wouldn't want that? And we only grow in love by drawing ever closer to God, by knowing Him more and more. So the question really for you, this day, this week, this year, is how will you grow in the love and knowledge of God? Amen. So in a moment, we'll have the Lord's Supper as a reminder for everyone. We will do procession and then the individual cups, this side of the church first, then this side. And there are gluten-free wafers too if you need, need one. Our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after they had eaten and he had given thanks, he took the cup, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which was shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me.
blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my sin. submission all is at rest I am my Savior I'm happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love this is my story this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. For those who are doing the individual cups, please open the bread. The body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Having received his body and his blood, be strengthened in your faith, knowing that through him your sins are forgiven. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Will you please stand as you are able? And let us pray as our Lord and Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. This is from Second Thessalonians. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ and our uh, and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. And now let's sing together our last song, All Creatures of Our God and King. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a blessed week, everyone.